Welcome to Keeping the World Company on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we'll talk about the question of whether the Intifada has come to the U.S. and how is BDS, Boycott, Divest, and Sanction, affecting our universities around the country and here in Hawaii. Our guests for the show are Gene Rosenfeld, independent scholar and lecturer, a retired lecturer from UCLA, Max Samaroff, a researcher with Stand With Us, mainland organization that deals with anti-Semitism uh, and BDS in universities and schools on the mainland, and Daphne Desser, uh, who is a tenured associate, did I get that right? Mm -hmm. Professor in the English department, Sure. Um, here at UH Manoa, and she's also an advisor to Hillel here at UH Manoa. Last but not least, Robert Littman, uh, who is uh, Dr. Robert Littman, uh, who is an archaeologist uh, and who is a professor at what the archaeology school, Robert, at UH no, Manoa. Professor in religion and ancient studies. That's R L A C, religion yeah. and ancient and studies. And, and, yes. At and I, the I named these at the University of Hawaii, Manoa, yeah. and uh, not necessarily in in order. I just named them, and but they're all here, and I'm happy to have them here. Thank you all very much for coming down, Robert. Why don't you go first? We're we're studying BDS here. We're still studying the Intifada and how it's coming to America, and what are the indicators of that. Uh, who is uh, doing coordination, command, and control on all these protests and uh, examples of um, BDS and anti-Semitism on campuses? Um, and I suppose uh, how fast it's moving. What is the threat involved to the Jewish people and otherwise? Uh, and where is it going? What can we do about it? That's the discussion today. So the first question, Robert, is you had a program on some of that anyway yesterday at UH Manoa. Can you talk about that program? Yes. Well, uh, yesterday uh, at Manoa, it was the opening of an exhibit of uh, concerning the, the Holocaust and Am American attitudes toward the Holocaust. Uh, and this exhibit is a nationally tra uh, traveling from uh, around the country um, that has been sponsored by the uh, Holocaust Museum in, uh, in Washington and various federal grants. Uh, and uh, this is exhibit will be for about five weeks in UH uh, Hamilton Library, um, and it really deals with American uh, attitudes uh, about anti-Semitism in America, uh, how America reacted, uh, and obviously uh, we also discussed uh, somewhat um, the Hawaii reaction to the Holocaust. Uh, how it influenced uh, our senators, particularly Senator Dan uh, Inouye. Uh, and it was a period in America where there was a great deal of anti-Semitism. Uh, and uh, it's sort of relevant to what's going on today because anti-Semitism is on the rise again, um, fostered uh, a lot by the uh, BDS movement uh, and generally uh, uh, what is what has happened is that um, anti-Zionism has been uh, anti-Israel Zionism has become a code word for anti-Semitism. Okay, just uh, to a little background of the of the Middle East and how we got to the present political situation. 1453, as a historian, I'll go back all the way to the uh, Turkish conquest of uh, the Middle East, the beginning of the Ottoman Empire. And it lasted till 1918, when uh, world at the end of World War One, the Ottoman Empire uh, broke up, and the, the area was uh, taken over by the British and the French. And this is what the map looked like uh, of the Middle East in 1930. Uh, now, uh, the British were in control of um, Palestine; it was then called Palestine, and uh, there was an attempt, there was Jewish settlement because of the Zionist movements that started in the end of the 19th century. But as an aside, the Jew Jews have always lived in uh, in Israel, uh, in Palestine. There's continuous Jewish inhabit and habitation um, for, for the last 3,000 years. Uh, the, uh, in 1947, 
the UN created a partition plan to divide, uh, to create uh, Israel and Palestine. And here uh, you can see on the left the what the map would have looked like. Part of the problem is that uh, Islam in general uh, has an antipathy toward non-Muslims. Surah 5, the Quran says uh, that uh, then when the sacred months are drawn away, slay the idolaters wherever you find them and take them and confine them and lie in wait for them at every place of ambush. But if they repent and perform the prayer and pay the alms, then let them go their way. So what has happened uh, at the time of the partition, um, Israel was a, uh, a sole uh, non-Muslim place in the, in the Middle East. There were many Christians and Jews in the in Middle East who were uh, discriminated against in uh, by the Arab populations. So what happened in, in 47, 1947 uh, is that at uh, 48, when you had the Declaration of Independence of Israel, uh, seven Arab countries invaded, trying to destroy the Jewish population uh, and drive them out, kill them or drive them out. Uh, the Jewish population uh, fought back and they captured a lot more land. You can see on the right, this is Israel after the armistice. So they took this land uh, in, in defense of, the, uh, uh, of, of their lives, in defense of their country. Then in um, 1967, the combined Arab countries again tried to, to destroy Israel. Now by 1967, the majority of the population of Israel uh, was made up of Jews who came from Arab lands. Starting in uh, in the 1950s, the uh, Arab countries, surrounding Arab countries, expelled all their Jews. They were driven out of Iraq, Iran, not so, uh, less so, uh, so, so, most of Iran, um, from Egypt, from Syria, uh, and about 500,000 Jews from Arab lands were driven out of their countries and settled in Israel. And by the 67 day war, the majority of the population were Jewish exiles from Arab lands. In 1967, a combined Arab, uh, uh, the combined Arab uh, countries tried to destroy Israel again. They invaded them. Israel in, in the six day war managed to defeat them decisively and took over the West Bank and the Sinai Peninsula. Subsequent to that, um, uh, again, in 1973, uh, um, uh, the, uh, there was another attack. Uh, this is the Yom Kippur War. Uh, and Israel again uh, defeated the combined Arab countries. So 48, 67, uh, um, um, uh, and in 73, they tried to annihilate Israel. Uh, and the Sinai was subsequently given back in the uh, King da in the, uh, the David Accords between Israel, when peace was established between Israel and Egypt. The West Bank and Gaza still remained under uh, uh, Israeli control. Uh, and Israel has tried uh, many, many times to uh, resolve the situation of the minority uh, population from the West Bank in Gaza. In Israel itself, the Arab population who were, were there have become citizens. You have Arab members of parliament. Uh, they live side by side with Israelis with full citizenship. It's the Arabs the West Bank and Gaza. Now, the other thing that we have to look at is what the systematic attempt by the Muslim countries of the Middle East to rid themselves of their Christian and Jewish uh, um, minorities. In 1930, for example, Turkey, or 1900 Turkey, 25% of the population of Turkey were uh, Christian and Jews. Today, 
uh, it, it's uh, 0.0002%. There are 100,000 Christians left and maybe 20,000 Jews left. Uh, they had the Armenian genocide, the driving out of the Greek Christians. And this has been the, the case in every Arab country. They have driven out their Christians, including the Arab Christians. Didn't matter whether they were uh, uh, what nationality, even Arab Christians were driven out. The one exception is Lebanon. And this, when the British partitioned and the French partitioned uh, Lebanon and Syria, um, they, the idea was to make a Lebanon a Christian majority and a Christian dominated. And uh, that has only worked to a certain extent because the uh, Arab, minor then an Arab minority has had a number of civil wars in Lebanon against, to try to drive out the Lebanese Christians. So when you look at uh, BDS and you look at the, the goal of BDS, it is basically to drive out the Jews. Doesn't matter that they're Jews who uh, are indigenous to Palestine or Jews who came from Iraq or other places in the Arab world. Uh, the Hitler tried to make uh, Juden, the world Judenfrei without Jews. The Palestinian Arab view is the same. Now we've uh, had peace with uh, Egypt. Uh, uh, um, and uh, peace is uh, Saudi Arabia is ready to sign peace treaties because economic necessity and a, a greater, not toleration, but a greater sense of reality has come to these countries that they're not going to be able to do it. Uh, now, as far as the Palestinians go, I just want to comment. I have a great empathy for the Palestinians. Everybody hates them. The Egyptians hate them. The Saudis hate them. Everyone hates them. Uh, the they are the stepchild of the Arab world. Uh, the uh, earlier um, in the period of the 60s, 70s, 80s, the uh, Arab uh, countries would not do anything to help them or resettle them, uh, but left them in camps to uh, um, act as an uh, uh, part of the the propaganda war against uh, Israel. Uh, in Egypt, uh, uh, Egypt will not let it today, till today, a single Palestinian in, if possible. Uh, and the reason for that uh, is that uh, uh, the Palestinians have been associated, uh, particularly in Gaza, with Hamas, with the Egyptian brother, with the Brotherhood, Egyptian, the um, Muslim Brotherhood, which is a terrorist organization, began in Egypt and spread to um, Palestine, uh, to Gaza. Now, when I, I was in Egypt during the revolution in 2013, and one of you could see one of the motives of the uh, army taking over and throwing out Morsi is that he was allying himself with the Palestinian mother, Muslim Brotherhood and sending resources to them. And that, um, and so it's an intractable, it's a difficult problem. And the people in BDS, BDS started uh, as an, a, a movement. Uh, it is uh, outlawed uh, in Germany. In Germany, the, the government declared it um, um, a um, uh, 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 pass resolutions against it. Um, the BDS uh, charter says they justify the use of armed resistance against the oppressors, military and civilian. Um, the BDS movement purports to be nonviolent, uh, but it is uh, goal is to, in effect, destroy the state of Israel and expel the Jews from Israel. Uh, and the idea, one of their tenets is the Palestinian law uh, to have a right of return for Palestinians, all the millions of Palestinians who once lived in the area. Uh, and of course, uh, Israel would never permit this because they have built a country out of, out of sand in the area. Uh, and 
they uh, have uh, held the land after th three major wars and many minor skirmishes and defended the area. And they will continue to uh, defend themselves. And BDS has been increasingly um, allied with Hamas. Uh, so I'll pass now over to some of the other participants. Uh, thank you, Robert. There's, there's more to talk about. Max, can you go next and tell us the situation in the United States, the situation on the college campuses? Um, you know, BDS sounds like it, it grew up in the Middle East, but it certainly has a presence here. What is the extent of that presence? What are its activities? Thanks, Jay. Uh, well, first, what uh, I think is important to know is that while uh, BDS brands itself as a movement that comes from Palestinian civil society and that started in 2005, the reality of the situation, and there are even leading BDS activists who have acknowledged this, uh, it's a movement that started internationally outside of the region, uh, in Europe, in the United States, uh, among you know, anti-Israel extremist activists. Uh, in 2002, you saw the first kind of wave of uh, anti-Israel divestment campaigns. Divestment is the D in BDS, uh, led by a professor at University of Illinois uh, named Francis Boyle, who uh, also is uh, incidentally a frequent guest or was a frequent guest on uh, Infowars, uh, which is a conspiracy, far-right conspiracy theory uh, you know, media outlet. Uh, so this is something that actually, uh, in a way, started on American and European university campuses and in other institutions abroad, and then kind of was rebranded as something coming from Palestinian civil society later on, uh, again, like I said, in 2005. Um, so we've been seeing this uh, since the early 2000s, and it's kind of ebbed and flowed, but uh, certainly since the atrocities of October 7th, we've seen a pretty unparalleled wave of anti-Israel activism and anti-Semitic activism in general, and specifically pressure on universities to divest from any company doing business with Israel, any Israeli company, um, and not just divest from companies, but also cut off all study abroad programs with Israel, uh, really sever all possible ties uh, with the world's only Jewish state. Uh, and uh, the, the key difference from past years that we've seen uh, where, you know, they would focus on student government resolutions to call for the university to cut ties with Israel in various ways. Um, you know, they might hold some events and some protests. Um, in this case, and likely we're going to see it carry over into this academic year, we already are, um, they are basically trying to grind the daily operations of many universities to a complete halt until the administrations and the boards of trustees give in to their demands, basically surrender and capitulate. Uh, this is happening at um, dozens of universities, if not more. Uh, and unfortunately, some of the universities have, if not fully capitulated to the demands of the anti-Israel extremists who are occupying buildings, who are basically preventing other students from accessing educational facilities on a regular basis. If they're not, if the administrations aren't completely capitulating to these folks, um, they're at least making certain compromises that invite only further escalation. Uh, and I understand the the calculations there uh, because they just really want the tents off of their lawn. They just want they they just really want the optics uh, and the brand and the reputation of their university to stop suffering from the tents on their lawns and the police potentially having to be sent in to remove them and the, you know the the uh, image of uh, you know, the university calling in police to remove, uh, you know, people who are branded peaceful protesters. Um, they don't want that. And they're, they're, they just looked for the easiest possible way to get rid of their short-term problem, not realizing that they were inviting further and further escalation, which is unfortunately what we think we're going to see a lot of more of this year. Uh, what I will say is that the idea of peaceful protesters, plenty of the people involved in these protests are well-meaning and genuinely peaceful. However, the organizations and and uh, both on campus and off campus that are spearheading these disruptions, these encampments, these protests, uh, 
They include, for example, National Students for Justice in Palestine, which on October 8th or 9th, I don't remember which, literally like, within 24 or 48 hours of the worst massacre of Jews since the Holocaust, uh, put out a, uh, a call to action to all of their chapters across the U.S. and Canada, of which I think there are over 150 or 200, calling what Hamas did that day a, quote, historic win. Okay, and we've seen that rhetoric of supporting uh, just the brutal massacre of Jewish people. And worse, uh, we've seen that rhetoric echoing across different campuses, also on the streets of cities and communities, on social media and beyond um, over and over and over again. And so there should be no confusion about where the driving force behind these, these protests is coming from. It's not calling for peace between Israelis and Palestinians. It's calling for uh, a Middle East with certainly without an Israel, and in many cases, without Jews at all. You know, Max, when you see all these, uh, you know, campuses involved and all these people protesting, uh, it suggests that there's a, there's a coordination effort here. There's a leadership effort. There's a command control effort coming from somewhere. Where is it coming from? And where's the funding coming from? It's a complicated question to answer. Uh, I think that these protests in some cases are have a level of decentralization, genuinely. I mean, there are different campus organizations in different places, and, and they see what's happening on other campus, and they just copy it. Uh, oftentimes, by the way, these organizations are getting a lot of funding from the university itself because they're registered student organizations, and they can request funding like any other group does, and sometimes they get a lot of it. Uh, but certainly, there is a network of off-campus, uh, narrow anti-Israel interest groups. Uh, they include American Muslims for Palestine, the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights, um, uh, Jewish Voice for Peace, which represents a very, very small sliver of the Jewish community and basically um, has you know, either acted or been used as a shield against very legitimate uh, criticism of the anti-Israel movement for promoting anti-Semitism. Uh, there's a whole list of these off-campus organizations that are providing support uh, for what's happening, the, basically the chaos uh, that's happening on campus. I think that the issue of foreign funding and foreign influence, it's real. I mean, I think the some part of the U.S. intelligence community uh, had released a report saying that Iran was involved in promoting protests in the U.S. Uh, I mean, I, I just the other day watched an interview, a translation of an interview with uh, a Hezbollah official who said that he was in Zoom meetings with young people from Europe, the UK, and the US, encouraging them to escalate and step up the protests. So certainly the foreign influence issue is there, but we also frankly can't discount that there are a ton of bad ideas being circulated by American academic institutions themselves. And they'd be doing it without any foreign influence. They're doing just fine at it, at it on their own. I think the foreign influence combines with it and makes it worse. And you know, certainly you have billions of dollars that's been spent by Qatar to promote uh, propaganda through Al Jazeera uh, and other, other um, avenues and by other states. Uh, but we also have to look inward and, and at our own academic institutions uh, and hold ourselves accountable for, you know, A, promoting a lot of these terrible ideas that don't help Israelis or Palestinians get closer to peace, uh, and B, from not being aware enough to resist the foreign influence that's trying to further divide and spread hate in our society. So, um, Daphne, um, UH Manoa campus, mm -hmm. um, there's a significant BDS presence there. You've seen that, you've heard it, you've, you've been engaged with it. Can you talk about it? Sure. So a few things I want to point out is that UH is one of about a dozen universities where anti-Israel faculty have launched a faculty for justice in Palestine chapter. So we want to make a distinction between the commonly referred to SJP and SFJP. Um, this is an initiative of the U.S. Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel. And what they're hoping to see are chapters form across campuses across the U.S. to create a quote unquote national federation. Um, they want to formalize the fa faculty mentoring of SJP students, and they tend to organize lots of anti-Israel teach-ins and other actions and promote BDS along with the academic boycott. 
So the point though here is that this is well organized and well financed. So they try to um, come across as a grassroots organization and tend to present themselves as somehow anti-capitalist. But the point is, if you look very carefully at the SFJP activities, they have snazzy websites, promotional materials, campaigns, publicity, petition templates, uh, many speaker series panels on teach-ins. All of that does not come from student fees or RSO funds, which are funds that are given by the university to groups. So what you, it's hard to find exactly where the funds come from because it's not registered as a 501c3, but we do know it's fiscally sponsored by a group called Westpac, W-E-S-P-A-C. And um, as was already mentioned, probably has financial relations with the American Muslims for Palestine group. So there is a NGO monitor piece on funding sources um, that is publicly available. Westpac receives funding from Crunchbase, which is an AI company, and the Sparkboke Foundation. Um, um, because the SJP branches on university campus are often actually not registered as 501c3 nonprofit organizations, they're not subject to laws requiring financial disclosure. Um, and so uh, most known funding for individual branches of SGP comes from funds distributed by student governments for student clubs, but that does not match the scope of activities. So actually we have a lot of funds coming in that, um, that are not part of that um, publicly available knowledge. So um, what I would say, um, hopefully that's enough information, I think, um, I don't want to go too far into the weeds here because most people will lose me, but it, you you can go to the NGO reports and you can find Westpac and you can find the companies. They are major American uh, investment companies that um, that have made contributions. You can see which the, which ones they are that have donated to Westpac, W-E-S-P-A-C, NGO Monitor. And so um, they like to purport that they're a grassroots anti-capitalist movement, but they're actually funded quite well by um, what we might call capitalist organizations. In terms of UH in particular, um, we also have, uh, we're also the site of um, a critical Zionist studies. Um, so that's one of the few sites, but we have uh, within Israel studies and within Jewish studies at large, um, at the very least, a division, if not um, a kind of takeover, um, where uh, one cannot assume that someone teaching within Jewish studies or Israel studies uh, wants Israel to exist um, necessarily. Uh, and so um, you have to look very carefully at where uh, the professor stands, right, and in coursework and research to actually gauge where that is. But, um, and so within the established sites of research and study, such as Israel studies and Jewish studies, you'll find this diversity already, ideological diversity that runs the full spectrum really um, from critique of Israel, full support of Israel to thinking Israel shouldn't exist at all. Um, but we also have now the emergence of a critical Zionist studies, which is openly anti-Zionist and uh, is in response to these existing organizations. Um, and UH happens to be the site of, of, uh, of that particular group um, and is involved in its organization. We also have UH faculty who have signed um, on to petitions um, related to what's been happening at Columbia um, that not only call for the academic cultural boycott of departments, of institutions, but what they are calling common sense boycotts of individual faculty members. So they have just upped the ante quite a bit. Um, so we have gone back and forth and we've lost that battle with AAUP, um, trying to say that academic boycotts uh, at large um, represent, uh, a, represent a movement that is in conflict with academic freedom. We've lost that battle because AUP has now come in, out in favor of academic boycotts. But this is the first time that we're seeing through petitions, this phrase 
a common sense boycott of individual faculty. And we have UH faculty who have signed that petition. So you can just Google it, find this petition, um, and you'll find the names there. So this means that we are now <laughs> at war with our own colleagues. And you know, for me, this means that um, whatever hope we had for discussion across difference, for traditional academic values that value dialogue, discussion across difference, the values of a traditional liberal education are under serious threat if we have faculty members who are openly and in public not afraid to say that they will enact what they're calling common sense boycotts of individual faculty members. This means that any of us could become targets. Um, so what, what we're seeing is a, I agree with what's been said earlier, an escalation. Um, and UH is certainly not an exception to that escalation. What about intimidation? It sounds like um, that you, if you get to be a target, you get intimidated. Uh, what's the experience of the Jewish student on the campus? What's the experience of Hillel and its members? Are you talking specifically about the University of Hawaii at Manoa? Yes. Okay, so I have to make clear that I'm I'm speaking as an individual at this point and not representing UH Manoa. Um, as I think I've made clear before, we have an active Title VI complaint um, that has been filed. It was filed um, uh, on behalf of students at the University of Hawaii at Manoa in response to faculty uh, activism um, within the classroom and outside of the classroom that they found uh, discriminatory on the basis of Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of religion, ethnicity, and country of origin. Uh, and there were, we had many, many cases and we did not receive uh, a lot of administrative response. And we are still in negotiations with the administration. There are a lot of common sense uh, responses that people have had in place, put in place, administrators at other universities, such as um, an ombudsman's office, uh, language that um, includes anti Semitism within DEI efforts, um, language that uh, a Title VI, the hiring of a Title VI coordinator, someone who handles Title VI complaints, just as we have for Title IX. Um, these sorts of uh, hiring, let's say, of uh, faculty who are able to teach on these matters in ways that include a variety of perspectives and who don't consider themselves um, to be in the employ of certain activist organizations or an allegiance to those activist organizations. None of those measures have been taken as of yet by the University of Hawaii system. It's not just University of Hawaii Manoa, it's an entire system across the islands, community colleges, four-year college, and the research university that's located in Manoa. So until we see some movement from the UH administration, um, the Title VI complaint will remain active. So Jean, um, I guess this leaves it to you to try to integrate what's happening uh, against a, a landscape of historical anti-Semitism a landscape of perhaps not enough attention paid to the Holocaust and to the plight of the Jewish people on campus? What is it that makes these students and faculty vulnerable to these uh, anti-Zionist anti and anti-Semitic arguments um, and movements? Uh, you must have many thoughts about that. We as human beings, uh, at least according to social psychologists, uh, irregardless of where we come from, what our ethnicity is, or what we believe in, we tend to have the same reactions to the same provocations. So that we can say that the German people under Hitler uh, were not generically more evil than uh, the allies fighting them and their populations, but rather they were responding to something that had with, they switched populations with Great Britain people would have responded the same way. So we have a condition here of polarization. Polarization involves dehumanization. Dehumanization are a series of uh, words and actions that uh, treat 
a targeted population, whether it's one individual or a group, as something less than those that are making the attack, that they are vermin, for example, uh, they are pests, uh, they are evil in themselves. And in order to change the attitude and deepen the polarization on both sides, each side has to regard the other side as less than a human being. And at least one historian in Israel has made this statement that at this point, things are so hardened in Gaza that in some respects, many people on both sides believe that the other side is not a human being. That is expected. Under social psychology experiments from the 20th century, we have learned that about 65% on average of any group of people who, if they are under the orders of an authority, whether it's somebody higher in their rank in the military, it is an elected official, uh, or it is an individual that they have pledged their individual loyalty to as a charismatic leader, they will follow what that authority tells them to do 65% of the time when that authority tells them to harm another person. That's rather shocking. And what it accounts, what what accounts for that is um, an exposure to words and actions that your own peer group will accept. Um, and what you 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 then move the the boundaries of what is normal. You normalize, we've used that word with respect to the rise of authoritarianism with the MAGA movement in the United States. And as things become more polarized, um, extremism, dehumanization, and the war of words continues. Propaganda is part of the science of war today. Clearly, Hamas has engaged in a narrative that they prepared long ago in the 1990s when they were beginning to rise in Oslo. The Oslo Peace Accords at one time looked like they were going to resolve uh, the situation in the Middle East between Arabs and Jews. Um, Yitzhak Rabin, the prime minister of Israel, was assassinated by an extreme right winger in Israel. Uh, the Oslo peace accords uh, were not implemented, even though they were accepted by the Palestinian Authority. And what transpired was then a, a sense of despair and the rise of Hamas as a jihadist organization. It is basically the same philosophy as Al-Qaeda, and is now in control of a substantial number of the Palestinian population. So the Hamas authority, if, if its narrative about Jewish colonialism, Jewish apartheid, Jewish genocide um, is accepted by a group of people, even outside of Palestine in the United States, uh, who can see this war going on, can see the suffering of civilians, which is always an occasion of war, by the way, um, without having much background and understanding that Jews did not colonize Palestine, um, that the apartheid there is a result of having to have secure boundaries and not be attacked for a fourth or fifth time. They were just attacked for the fourth time. Um, then... What happens is that people regard one side or the other as the authority. And if you regard the Palestinian narrative as the authority, uh, you accept uh, the BDS idea that if you boycott Israel and uh, you expel, um, if you expel Jewish uh, people from teaching in the universities, and if you somehow get rid of the countervailing narrative about Israel's right to exist. And if you advance slogans like from the river to the sea, or you call uh, Jews, all Jews, anti-Zionist, that somehow you can normalize, you can raise the ante and normalize your side of the situation. Unfortunately, we've seen this play out before in the 1930s and prior to that time even in Jewish uh, uh, among Jewish professors in German universities. I mean, Germany was determined to expel any thinkers or people who might 
come up with a, a, a more rational and, and convincing narrative in the 1930s. Uh, they expelled their Jewish philosophers. Hannah Arendt, uh, for example, came to the United States. Uh, and she is an authority, leading authority even today on authoritarianism and what's happening today. Um, they even expelled Albert Einstein, who you know, threatened him so that he had to leave the greatest thinker perhaps in the world. And um, so there was no respect for ideas. And what we're seeing in the university and what you've just heard three very informed people tell you is that the respect for ideas and knowledge and reason has to be eradicated first. If you get rid of countervailing ideas, you could then free to use your own words and your own actions to characterize your enemy and polarize further and, and win the situation. What we have now, look at Columbia University. That's where these protests first really ran the gamut. Jewish students were feeling very harassed, very unsafe. They would go to the administration and complain. The administration had no way of dealing with it. They were used to other minorities uh, and discrimination. But being Jewish, they didn't think that was a minority group that was going to be harassed and discriminated against. So they had no mechanism for dealing with it. Ultimately, um, it, it created such a problem that uh, they had to replace people at the top of the administration. And they came out with a report. The second report that just came out from Columbia University gives you a definition of anti-Semitism based upon what's happening now. It gives you, uh, they, they talked to 500 students who had experienced anti-Semitism on campus and they detail the kinds of things that happen. Then they detail the lack of response on the part of the university and finally admitting that they had to do something. They come up with a variety of ways in which to respond. One way is to keep outsiders out of the campus altogether because yes, outsiders are involved in advancing the narratives. I wanna pursue that, Jean. I wanna pursue that in the time we have left and I'm gonna go around the table and I'm gonna ask, uh, uh, starting with Max, I'm gonna ask what can be done because I think from this discussion, it's clear that we're on a continuum that includes the possibility of violence. Um, and if it gets much worse, you know, you could predict violence. But Max, what is Stand With Us doing? You're researching, you're collecting data, hopefully you're collecting names of people who foment this kind of unrest and anti-Semitism. But in the larger sense, what can we do? Everybody at this table is Jewish, you know? What can we do? So, uh, first, just for those who don't know us, we're an international uh, nonprofit organization were dedicated to educating the public about Israel and fighting anti-Semitism. And we pursue that mission in a very wide variety of ways uh, on campuses and also in, in K through 12 education and other areas of society. With campus life and, and with students, we approach it from a, a number of different angles. One is that uh, we have programs for uh, Jewish student leaders and, and allied student leaders of the Jewish community uh, to educate them and empower them and help them educate others about uh, who are Jews, what is anti-Semitism uh, and uh, Israel and, and current events, everything that's going on. We, we give that empowerment to uh, students in campuses all over the US, Canada, even in other countries uh, to be able to educate their peers. And and really push back on a grassroots level against all of the misinformation and propaganda and hatred that we're seeing. Uh, so that's one big piece of it. Uh, another piece of it is that uh, when, like some, uh, Daphne mentioned Title VI, uh, we have a legal department that supported students on many different campuses now, uh, out, like on the mainland, um, who have also filed Title VI complaints due to university administration inaction in the face of ongoing hostility and anti-Semitism. Uh, so that's uh, that, That's another approach to it. And we have partner organizations that work with faculty. Uh, there's so many university stakeholders uh, that can make an impact. So you know, we, we partner with alumni organizations as well uh, to make an impact on these things. 
Max, do you find that some of them are afraid to take a public stand because uh, even though they're not Jewish, they don't have a horse in the race. Um, if they they may think that if they get um, into an organization which is defending the Jewish people, they may be attacked themselves. You find that? So I think there's a variety of of responses to uh, you know even before October seventh, but certainly after. Uh, so one actually, I, I just I want to step back for a second and and just share a little bit of data. Uh, so there's a couple of major surveys that uh, came out in last academic year, uh, one showing that over 70% of Jewish students had directly experienced or witnessed anti-Semitism on their campuses. And another, that's from ADL and Hillel International, and another one from Brandeis University, which found that the vast majority of Jewish students see denying Israel's right to exist as a form of anti-Semitism, which... You tran to translate that, that means anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, according to the vast majority of Jewish students, and that their feelings of, uh, of, of facing hostility as Jews were closely tied to the level of anti-Israel hostility on these campuses. So these things are, I mean, they're not always the same anti-Semitism and you know, anti-Israel bias, but there's a strong overlap. And from the student end, we see a range of reactions. Some students they look at they've looked at this and said, "I'm getting up off the sidelines and I'm going to speak out and I'm going to be the proudest and loudest uh, Jew that I can be uh, because I'm just not going to take it anymore." And a lot of those students come to us and uh, utilize our resources uh, in training and empowerment uh, and and do amazing things. Um, there are plenty of other students who, uh, like you said, have uh, you know been scared into silence uh, and and you know hide the fact that they're Jewish if they can. Uh, and then, you know, from folks who are not involved in looking at this, and also from the administration end of it, um, I think there's very widespread fear of just saying or doing the wrong thing. It's not that everyone is uh, extremely or inherently hostile to the Jewish community. Uh, the vast majority of people are not. They're just ignorant, and they see an extremely hot, divisive and emotional and oftentimes hostile uh, you know, debate going on, or even not a debate, like a, you know, just like total disruption of university life going on. Uh, and they're afraid uh, to, to, they're just paralyzed by fear of, of, you know, moving in one direction or another. And I think the answer to that is just more and more and more education uh, to the extent that people are willing to learn so that they can understand when, you know, they hear a Jewish studies professor on their campus uh, argue that Israel has no right to exist, that yes, that professor has a right to their opinion and academic freedom to, to publish whatever they want, uh, but they represent a very small minority and Jewish people are just as, as, as uh, capable of promoting bad ideas and bigoted ideas as anyone else. Uh, it's not about the person's identity, it's about the, the actual merit of the ideas that they're promoting um, and also the impact on the wider community. Um, so that they they basically have they have an understanding of what anti-Semitism is and who the Jewish people are. We assume people know these things, but the vast majority honestly know nothing about us. Uh, and so mm -hmm. it has to start with education. And you know, after after that education happens, if there is still inaction in the face of anti-Semitic discrimination, uh, that's that's when legal action becomes necessary. Um, yeah. Through all of it, our community just has to find our courage and our resilience uh, and stand up for ourselves uh, in every way possible, uh, because uh, there's there's really no other option. Yeah, Robert, your, your thoughts. Uh, you've been thinking about this for a long time. And yeah, I wonder where the where the legal aspect fits in answering the question, what can we do? What should we do? Is there a significant benefit in, in establishing a legal campaign here? If you look what's happened in Germany, Germany, the German government has been particularly sensitive about uh, anti-Semitism, uh, partially because of the history of persecution of Jews in Germany. They have uh, censured uh, BDS. They uh, uh, will not permit in the public sphere uh, anti-Semitism. It seems to me that what we the best route forward is the strengthening of Title VI, 
and there are uh, additional amendments that various congressmen are trying to put to strengthen Title VI. Uh, and after all, a lot of this problem uh, is end endemic to Western civilization and, of course, Muslim civilization. There is anti-Semitism is baked into the cake uh, as uh, Jews as a minority group and a group ha who have denied uh, Christ. Uh, they are considered a, a pariah. Uh, and there's that lingering baked in anti-Semitism in Western civilization. Fortunately, the world since the uh, enlightenment in the 18th century is getting more and more enlightened. Uh, but the best way going forward, I think, is the pushing of Title VI. Universities receive hundreds of millions of dollars from the federal government. UH itself probably receives well over a billion dollars when you come from the federal government, when you come find the grants that they get and the support of students through Pell Grants, Title VI has teeth. And it seems to me that the best way forward is to work on a, on a congressional level and also on a local level to, uh, uh, to keep uh, putting the teeth of, of Title VI uh, behind not only Jews, but every other minority uh, that's subject to uh, discrimination and hostility uh, on campus. Well, thank you, Robert. Uh, Daphne, um, what can we do? What can I do? What can you do? What can Robert and Max and Jean do to deal with this? Speak up. The tactic is to frighten us out of speaking. The tactic is ideological domination. The tactic is this is the way we all think in certain departments, in certain disciplines. And we've seen this all the way up to university administration. We're well aware of where certain faculty lie. And my perception of this is they're afraid of those faculty members. Those faculty members will protest. Those faculty members will be active. Those faculty members will go after administrators who don't follow their agenda and take them down. So administrators themselves are scared to deal with these activist professors who have their own agenda, right? So they've learned they can push the discourse and almost no one is going to stop them. So what we have to do is not be afraid and to enter into the critical dialogue and discussion that we have been called to do as citizens, as students, and as professors, that we model what we are inheritance, which is the liberal arts education, which means that we believe in public fora, we believe in discursive action, we believe in learning and listening from one another, and we reject intellectual bullying, we reject ideological domination, we reject simplifying complicated issues for the sake of simplifying activism, Right, so we have uh, a, a set of values that is our inheritance. It's a set of values that is global. It goes across Western, civil Western and Eastern civilizations. And it is, not, it is not just for the Jewish people, right? It is a human value. That's what we have to stand up for. This is not a fight just for ourselves, so to speak. It is not a fight for the Jewish people. It's a fight for what needs to happen on an intellectual level. So we all have a calling. We're all called to stand up when the discussion is not fair, when people are being bullied, when people are frightened to state their points of view. Once we are in that kind of terrain, we are going in the wrong direction and we all know that. So listen to your own conscience, listen to your own heart. And if you feel afraid to speak up, then it is time to speak up. Well, let me offer the opportunity for any or all of you to speak up on Think Tech Hawaii. You just let me know when, and we'll follow this subject. Jean, can you help us close? And arguably from a, an historic point of view, we're at an inflection point, uh, my view, uh, as far as anti-Semitism is concerned, anti-Zionism is concerned. Uh, we, we hear the echoes of, of the Holocaust here. Um, what do we do about that? How do we see that? Do you agree that we're at an inflection point? And if so, how do you deal with an inflection point? 
tipping point? Not quite yet, no. I think there is uh, greater preparation on the part of the Jewish people, whether they are in Israel or in America, and hopefully in Europe, uh, that they have learned that uh, never again means uh, you have to mobilize. You have to mobilize uh, in terms of uh, any tactics or strategies or laws uh, or opportunities to set the record straight. Uh, everyone is entitled to their own opinion. But when that opinion becomes nobody else should have any opinion except mine, uh, we are now at the tipping point of totalitarianism. And if we give our allegiance to leaders who are promoting only one narrative and targeting the other group, the other's narrative as something less than human, um, we're at a tipping point. And we need to, first of all, acknowledge and recognize when we're at a tipping point. Resistance begins with individuals who take a stand and who have to understand when something is against their values and is wrong. What these experiments showed when people were instructed to do harm by authorities, but doing that harm, giving electric shocks in this case to individuals they did not know, um, what went against their own values, they did it anyway. And they were, they were anxious and sweating and, and, and suffering from having to do something that was against their own values, but they did it anyway. And in order to counter that, what the 35% of the individuals on average who did not conform to what the authority told them to do, what they did is first recognize that this was against their values and they weren't going to listen, that they were going to listen to what they knew and what they believed. And if they did that right from the beginning, then they did not collaborate with the experiment to do harm. Individuals who protested verbally and said, no, no, I think somebody here is being deeply harmed and we really shouldn't be doing this. And then the authority would override and say, yes, we have to do this. There's a higher reason. There's a better reason for doing this. And they would go ahead. They would lose their autonomy. They would lose their moral compass. They would go ahead. They would be uncomfortable, but they would still do it. So the key is first to recognize it. Secondly, not to collaborate. Thirdly, to enlist others, because you have to have more than one person uh, to create a counter movement. And to, um, to not become captive to uh, apathy. Those that do not take any action whatsoever, the so-called indifferent bystander, is really the reason why populations are captured by authoritarians and violent individuals who would do evil to others, because it's that indifferent group that could make the difference. And mm -hmm. we as educators are tasked and called to inform individuals about good and evil, not just about opinions and um, facts and forces. We need to build in knowledge of good and evil in our curriculum. Yeah, our roles change with changing times. Well, from your collective lips to God's ears, thank you, Gene Rosenfeld. Thank you, Max Samaroff. Uh, thank you, Robert uh, Littman, and thank you, Daphne Desser. This has been a wonderful discussion. Really appreciate it. Aloha. Mm -hmm.